Welcome to The Screen Queen, where I'll be talking about your favorite movie or your favorite TV show. You'll just have to listen to find out. Here is your host, Samantha Parrish. Hello there, and welcome back to the show. As always, my name is Samantha Parrish, and I am your female Tarantino, your Screen Queen. So here we are. It is the last episode of the birthday series, and I'm so thrilled that it lands on my birthday. This is this is amazing. I'm I'm really thrilled that this is going to air on my birthday. When I was preparing for this episode, I had to think about the fact that we don't get too many films that has to do with the inner workings of a shop. And we've seen that with Clerks and then High Fidelity came out. But Empire Records is sort of that meat in the middle that came out after Clerks and came out before High Fidelity to still offer the same type of entertainment with having these compelling stories of all of these different people and you get a badass soundtrack at the same time. Like, what more could you ask for? That's that's a simple one. I watched Empire Records at a very young age of my life and Empire Records served as one of the influences that made me the person I am today. My taste in music is thanks to this film. My taste in storytelling is thanks to this film. Even a majority of the way that I write today is solely with the atmosphere that comes from this movie. This is one of the most underrated films in my life. And I say that because I watched at a young age where no one knew what this was. And it's had a very interesting history afterwards. Not many people know that a lot of the films we see today and most of the people that we see in films, this was one of their starts. Just saying. It's going to blow your mind about this film. So strap yourself in, get your favorite record, get your pot brownies, and let's get into Empire Records. So... What is Empire Records? I I know that there are some listeners out there that have never heard of this film, and that is perfectly okay. This just this just like sunk into the history of the '90s. Empire Records follows the story of six employees that uh, they're not winning the best employee award, but let's just say they earned their keep at the shop. This is what a hell of a day at Empire Records, where shit is about to get real. Joe, the manager, is trying everything he can to keep the shop, but unfortunately, Lucas, his star employee, and pain in his side, decides to gamble the money at a casino in the hopes of getting twice as much and didn't end well. So now, we're into the shop not knowing if there is going to be an Empire Records by the end of the day. On top of trying to save Empire Records, there is a famous musician named Rex Manning coming to the shop to have an autograph signing for his latest album that he's not proud of. Corey, one of the most reliable employees, is going to Harvard. And that is going to have to make the character AJ pick up the pace and tell her that he loves her before she has her next to last days at the shop. And on top of that, there might be some issues going on with the employees that have mental health issues. So I just gave you a whole bunch of plot points, but that's the best way to sum up this film is that it there's not really a plot, there are plot points. There's not a central plot because you go through the entirety of these characters and you bounce around so much that you get enough time with them to know how do you want this movie to end. You want a resolve for all of these characters. Time is tested. Time is of the essence in this film. That is honestly the best way that I can sum up this synopsis. I even went on IMDb for the hell of it just to see if there was anyone else that could kind of give like a more simplified version. But the version I gave is kind of on par with the way people have talked about this film as a synopsis. This is honestly one of those films that you have to watch for yourself. It's very self-explanatory to get into the groove of things because you get thrown into this world where something happens one right after another after another, like I said. 
But that's like the great thing about it is that it's so constant, it keeps your attention. Sometimes that can be death to writing where you have so much going on that you would have breathing room. But these characters are so charming and so engaging that you get these moments of breathing room in between the events and the investment that you see between all these characters, you feel like you're right there with them. Everyone does not feel lesser or greater than the others. Another great way to sum up this film is it's a film for the music lovers. You get history 101 with almost every genre of music, almost every decade of music, and it makes it feel like a time capsule that's not necessarily for the 90s, but just in general. You get the weight of how music has aged so many years and how it's made a home in every store. And what's really unique is to see the way that all these employees enjoy the music. You still get their lives. I love the plot of this film, but I also love how the music marries within the film, but the music doesn't take over the film. But there is something that I do want to point out. There are two different versions of this film. So if you were to go on Hulu right now and type in Empire Records, you're going to be seeing a film that goes on for an hour and like 47 minutes. That's not the film that you should see. When I got my hands on this movie, I found out that I did not get the entirety of this film. Just like what I mentioned with Sailor Moon, I'm like, there's more that I did not see from this film. I highly encourage you, if you get the chance to find it, find the, the extended edition. It is so much better and it actually fills in the gaps for a lot of the parts in this film because again it's so eventful that you need to have some explanation in the very beginning of the movie i remember the character lucas was counting the money and he's getting ready to go and gamble the money however there's a part in between him counting the money and then him going to vegas there is a woman that stops at the last minute just because. And Lucas is like, we're closed, we're closed, we're closed. And she's hell-bent on getting in there, and Lucas is like, fuck it, oh well, I'll, I'll let her in, and I'll just make sure to keep an eye on her. And then they end up bonding, and they go to Vegas together. And you never see her again. However, if you scrap that moment, you miss virtually nothing, but I like that scene for the fact that Lucas does take his job seriously. That ties in with him counting the money, and making the trip to go to Vegas. So again, that seems kind of a double-edged sword. But the next one, I have some issues with. I mentioned earlier that one of the characters, Corey, is going to Harvard. And she finds out that day she's going to Harvard. Her little sister comes by the shop with the letter from Harvard. And they all find out together that she's going to Harvard and there's this excitement, there's this pizzazz, everyone is ecstatic. You can tell from that scene how much they're so proud of Corey. The other scene regarding Harvard, it's not as strong as that one. The only mention where you have Harvard last long enough is when she has delivered flowers that come from her father and there's like a little note on there that says, uh, just keep striving for excellence. And uh, Corey says, man, nothing is never enough for him. And that scene is somewhat strong. Corey does kind of fit the archetype of the hardworking student that obviously has been pushed by her parents to keep doing better. And that is great on its own. But not getting to see the reaction of the people that she's close to that is a much better scene than the minimal scene about Harvard. Harvard is almost saying like a grocery note. And even though they mention it, oh my gosh, Corey's going to Harvard. Corey's going to Harvard. It would have been much more impactful if they left that scene in the first cut of the film, which makes me glad that it exists in the extended because it made a world of difference to Corey's character and the role that she has in the shop. But the whole Harvard note wasn't just the only thing that felt shoved to the side. There was a whole bonding part between Joe and Lucas that went completely expunged. 
Now, for the most part in the film, the character Joe and the character Lucas have a pretty solid relationship that even though they yell at each other, you know that there's something behind their relationship as to why Joe keeps Lucas around. When Joe and Lucas are sitting outside, Joe is just fucking exhausted from today, from all the events going on with his employees pissing him off, the idea of his store going to go away, just like that. And Lucas is right there with him. Lucas knows he is the reason why things are going downhill. There is nothing else to say. It is a very mature thing that Lucas is doing and it's his way of taking accountability for what happened. There's a lot of respect he has for Joe, even if he doesn't say it. Even though you've never seen these two on a day-to-day -day basis, and this is the only time you see them is within these 24 hours, you get the full weight of what their relationship is like solely with this scene. Joe sits there and he has a serious mental health venting session that he doesn't even realize that he's doing because his eyes are so distant. And he just says, my father always said to me, you will never amount to nothing. And Lucas can't take it. And he just goes, Joe, you're worth so much more. And like praises him in such a way, but Joe just can't believe it. And says, Lucas, you stole $9,000 trying to save the place. Okay, it's over. And then he pats him on the shoulder and goes back inside. That scene really solidifies how this movie works. We know from the get-go in this film that Lucas took the $9,000 that Joe had saved away to gamble it and try to get money. And of course, Joe is furious. But never once in the entire film does Joe say, Lucas, get out of here. Lucas, I hate you. He says, damn it, Lucas, of course, because I feel like that's the law in that shop with how Lucas is irritable. But Lucas does take accountability. He was trying to do the right thing. And Joe does see that, despite how mad he is. He knows Lucas cares about the shop as much as he does. That moment really sees how these two are able to deal with conflict and understanding with each other but also too their problems weren't solved the movie's not over yet but you had like a solid talking with these characters this movie thrives on communication it's what one of the main reasons why i love it when i got to know it when i was much older but there's also another thing in this film that doesn't get enough credit and that's how they handled mental health i've talked about mental health before that the depiction in the 90s is like a silent echo that we weren't there yet but you have films like empire records that didn't feed an answer of the be all end all but just addressing it bringing it to the plate so i want to shift focus to one of the characters that had the strongest story in my opinion and that is deborah from the get-go of the movie there is a concern about the character Deborah. Deborah has, now this is a trigger warning, a large bandage on her wrist. And all of the characters have their own way of being concerned that they know what happened without having to point blank say, did you self-harm? They're trying to get her to say it. And they're not going to let it go. Specifically the character AJ. AJ is like, so flabbergasted and so deathly concerned for Deborah. Again, you've never seen these characters at another day in their life. This is the only day you see them, but you know when she hits the fan, they're going to be there for each other. This is one of those examples. Then you have the character Lucas, who also knows that Deborah is not ready to talk about it and has a way of diluting the situation that... Deborah's okay, she's here at the shop, let's let her be in her bubble. You know, Lucas is one of the characters that is, like, not the brightest bulb in the ship, 
but he knows how to divert a critical situation and give someone their privacy that you can't yank the information out of someone. And boy, does the mental health have a hell of a payoff when the characters decide to have a fake funeral for Deborah, um, kind of giving in to the fact that she needs to open up about her mental health, but they're also making her participate. And she's not really one to participate, but the fact that she would, she's like, okay, all right. Shows you that she does have a soft spot for them. And when everyone's venting about what's going on in their lives accidentally, and then she talks about why she did it. And it is heartbreaking. The crew just stands there in silence and support. Corey leans down and kisses Deborah's forehead and just says, we love you, Deborah." And it's simple, but I like that it's simple. Deborah needs to get help and she has a lot of support coming her way. And it's so nice to see how that comes together. And also as a complete random side note, not many people know this, but if you're familiar with a little 1996 witch hit called The Craft, then you're going to find the actress Robin Tooney very familiar. After she played Deborah in Empire Records, she went on to go play the character Sarah in The Craft. However, because the character Deborah has a shaved head, because of the dedication to the character of Deborah, that was why she wore a wig in The Craft. When I learned that and like saw the timeline, realizing because of this movie, it changed the way that Robin Tooney had to play the character in the craft. I also got so much mad respect for Robin Tooney for her dedication to the characters to go that far to depict mental health and to get the character accurate. And I really love what she did for both of these roles. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have fun tying this into the craft episode. So I want to switch gears here and talk about one of the reasons why this film is semi-famous. And that's the soundtrack. I mean, come on. It's a movie about a record store. And they have the boppiest bops that ever bopped. I know that there are many movies about music out there. But there's never really going to be one like Empire Records that had music commentary from the characters and had a representation and presentation of current music or older music that ranged from the most popular or the ones that were really hidden away. You can find some serious hidden gems in this film. I would have to say that the soundtrack for this film is like a one-size-fits-all. There's no way that someone couldn't find a vibe from this soundtrack. It's going to speak to someone's soul for what they get into for music. This movie really is a musical appreciation for every artist and every genre. Personally, my favorite song from the movie is A Girl Like You by Edwin Collins. I, I love that song. This movie is the reason I know that song and I haven't stopped listening to it since I saw this film at 13 years old. Every time I listen to it, it just takes me back to Empire Records. The music they handpicked for the film is fantastic, but then there's the music that was made for the movie. So there are two songs made for the film, and personally, I see them as commentary for what it's like to be a musician, but how much passion you have to have to be a musician. The first one is Say No More, Monet More by Rex Manning who is played by Maxwell Caulfield, who is no stranger to the realm of music since he's already gotten his, uh, his startup with Grease 2, one of my favorite bad movies. So I know he can sing. But it's not the best song, but I think it was written to be like that. <laughs> Come on, it has to be a joke. It is such a cheesy title. Oh my God. Like, it's one of those songs that you enjoy for the beat, but then you also can laugh at the lyrics that it's not meant to be a serious song because Rex Manning himself is not a serious guy. He's 
arrogant. He's a pissant. And he could do something better, but he chooses not to. Rex Manning became one of the examples of someone involved in the industry that loses their spark and would rather just give in to the demands of the agents just to do whatever songs came out there and became a product of that. It just exists in the film. And that's perfectly okay. It's not going to be uh, having a, a new lease on life, but I'm glad that it exists in the film for its own reason. And like I always say, you choose how you want to be entertained. But then there's the song by Renelle Zellwinger that really solidifies the strive and drive to be a musician and taking advantage of the moment and not being afraid to be a musician. It is a song called Sugar High that's performed by Coyote Shivers and Renee Zellwinger. This was near the end of the film when they did like this huge benefit to save Vampire Records and one of the plot points was the character Gina wanted the chance to sing and she finally got it. Guys, this movie is the reason why Renee Zellwinger was in Chicago and it shows. She did such a fucking phenomenal job singing that song i want to marry that song tuck it in every night before i go to bed and just say i'm so glad you exist i love that they did this for the film i love that song it so physically pains me that it's not well known even though renee zellwinger has had a very successful life because the biggest movie of her life would come out the next year after Empire Records with Jerry Maguire. But this film is still one of the biggest backs to her career that landed her in roles that required someone with a very decent singing voice. The directors that worked with her have cited that they signed her on solely with the way that they saw her in Empire Records. So it's a funny parallel to see that there's a song made by an established actor in this film that was made as a joke, and then you have a song made by an unknown actress at the time that would eventually go on to have the biggest year of her life with Jerry Maguire, and she makes the best song in the whole film. I'm just saying. So the reason that I got into this film was to find more movies from the actor Roy Cochran, who plays Lucas. And just so you know... Roy Cochran was one of my very first celebrity crushes back in the day. My mother picked on me relentlessly for finding films that had to do with Roy Cochran. Like, I'd give her this list and God bless my mother. She kept finding the films for me and that was like her only way to kind of like get through this very weird uh, mission to find these movies for me was by making fun of me. <laughs> So we both got something out of it. She got to make fun of me and I got to have Roy Cochran. Everybody wins. But when I saw the film, I was already immersed into a lot of procedural dramas, which I also watched with my mom. I was very surprised to see how many people would eventually go on to crime shows. It's actually one of the leading parts of trivia is that a majority of this cast went on to go star in procedural dramas. So I'm going to go from the get-go. Uh, Anthony LaPaglia, who plays Joe, would go on to Without a Trace. Roy Cochran, who I just mentioned that plays Lucas, would go on to CSI Miami. Johnny Whitworth, who plays AJ, also went on to CSI Miami. Robin Tooney went on to the show The Mentalist. And then there was Renee Zellwinger in the biotopic, The Thing About Pam, and it's not a procedural drama, but it's still a crime drama, so I'll count it. And I think everyone else just kind of dabbled here and there with some things in procedural dramas, but a good, like, 70% of the cast would eventually go on to crime shows, and it's kind of funny to see that coincidence. But then there's another coincidence that happened in this movie, and oh boy, y'all are gonna grit your teeth when I tell you this. So what I'm going to tell you about is probably the most awkwardest thing I may have ever learned about for a movie. So one of the other factors of this film that also pushes the music note is that Aerosmith's daughter is in this, Liv Tyler. Now here's the awkward thing. Her stepfather is also in the film. 
Her stepfather is Coyote Shivers. Coyote Shivers is only eight years older than Liv Tyler. Her mama married a young man. I don't know how she did it. I don't know how she was able to, like, maintain composure and have to tell people, yep, that's, that's my stepfather. Yep. But thankfully, their time on screen was about as short as their time being a blended family. There wasn't a very long marriage between her mother and Coyote Shivers, but damn, this is like one of the things I look at for this film and just go, yeah, that's, that, that exists. That unfortunately exists. So I just finished up my notes and I just want to give one last praise to this film. I love that this is a timeless film, but I love that this is a film that has many different uses. People can watch this film for the plot of the film, or they can watch it for the music and just have it for background noise. It is such an enjoyable film to have as a comforting presence that there's something going on that's not too taxing, but there's something going on that keeps you invested. This film has kept me coming back since 2008 when I first watched this film and realizing that this film is going to be turning 30 years old next year is wild. It's one way for me to realize how old I am very quickly. That when it turns 30, I turn 30. The best way that I can describe this film is that it's a simple film, but it's a perfect simple film. There are so many things to get invested with. Like the friendship that Gina has with Corey and how they came to a resolve. How Lucas and Joe have this very interesting father-son relationship that almost beats out most father-son relationships I've seen in films and movies and TV shows. And seeing AJ and the way that he wants to confess to Corey that he needs to take advantage of the moment. Everything about this film is taking advantage in the moment. It's one of the core like reasons why the story was made. The whole theme about it. It's invigorating and it's inspiring. It it makes you realize you got to take advantage of the moment. You got to keep going no matter what happens. You need to be where you have to be in life. Even if that means you have to make changes and you have to be okay with those changes. And this film did a good job encapsulating on that theme. All I have to say is that this movie is music to my ears. And that is the best cheesiest line I have done. I don't know, it just keeps going every single episode, but this was a fun series. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for being here. And now is the time to find out what the next episode is going to be on the screen, Queen. Okay, so uh, we're back to the big box of all the selections. Here we go. Let me mix this up and pray that nothing falls out again. Here we go. All right, I feel like that's mixed up enough. I'm going to pick from the bottom that's what you're supposed to do. Just, no, give me the thing. I keep dropping it. Okay. Okay, I'm down for that. It's been a while since we've had a film in that era. Okie dokie. Alrighty, so the next episode on the screen, Queen, is going to be to kill a mockingbird. We're getting a classic up in here, man. If you want to catch up with me in between uploads, you can find me on my Instagram at the queen of the screen. If you would love to talk about Empire Records or if you have a film or a TV recommendation, definitely hit me up. If you also want to see the funny movie related things that I post up on TikTok, you can find me at the mystical space witch. And if you're interested in the series that I wrote that also has to do with people that work a very hectic life, you can check out my dark humor crime series in Glorious Inc. in the description box. Alrighty. Well, I'm gonna get along with my birthday week. You all take care now and stay amazing. This is your screen queen signing off. Bye bye